Hello everyone, my name is Azeda and I'm one of the junior doctors in the A to Z and ENT uh, committee. Today I will be talking to you about epistaxis and what to do when you are faced with it. Um, so today I want to cover the causes of epistaxis, give a basic understanding of any anatomy behind a nosebleed, learn about some questions you can ask a patient with a nosebleed, explore any treatment options and find out about some aftercare advice to give your patient. So if we start off, what is epistaxis? In simple words, it's a nosebleed um, and it's caused by damage to blood vessels that supply your nose. Quite often it happens a lot in the community and it's, all, it's very self-limiting, but can sometimes be life-threatening, which is when we get involved as ENT doctors or surgeons. So lots of different causes, as you can imagine, um, local trauma like kid picking their nose or a foreign body can cause epistaxis and that, that is one of the most common causes. You could also get um, facial fractures or facial trauma that can cause this to happen. Um, any uh, hematological concerns like inherited bleeding disorders or low platelets. If a patient is on anticoagulation like warfarin, or has uncontrolled hypertension, they can get epistaxis. And even in hospital, you get iatrogenic drying. So if a patient is on lots of oxygen that's not humidified for a long period of time, they can get epistaxis. So anatomy-wise, what's really important is this um, area in the anterior nose, as you can see, um, called, the lit uh, called the Kaiselbach plexus or Little's area which is where a lot of the arteries that supply your nostrils converge, such as the sphenopalatine artery, the posterior and anterior ethmoidal arteries, your superior labial artery and greater palatine artery. So it plays a big role in you know, why you get um, a nosebleed. If we were to um, classify a nosebleed then into two separate sections, we can talk about anterior and posterior nosebleeds. So anterior bleeding is bleeding in the littles area so if you if a kid picks their nose and causes trauma to the arteries in the littles area you get anterior bleeding it's quite common more often self-limiting um, and blood comes from the nostril downwards if you get a posterior bleed uh, which as you can see here would be in the back of um, your nose it, the blood goes down the oropharynx so down the back of your throat more than it comes out the front and it's usually um, a break in your fellow sphenopalatine arteries, and it's more likely to require specialist input to, to help stop. So let's say you are a junior doctor um, in ENT and you've just started your night shift. You're called by the ward and they just want some advice over the phone for a nosebleed that started for one of their patients. What advice can you give over the phone? So basic first aid advice for nosebleed, as some of you may already know, is to sit the patient forward, um, pinch, tell them to pinch the soft cartilaginous part of their nostril at the bottom, um, shut for 20 minutes and lean forward and uh, whatever blood that collects in their mouth for them to spit it out into a sick bowl. Um, and then you can also use ice packs either on the forehead or on the back of their neck to help cause some vasoconstriction. And most nosebleeds resolve with that. Um, 20 minutes is the key though. Two minutes won't cut it. Um, so if you look, you wander down, let's say to the ward and you see this happening, what's wrong with this picture? So as you can see, patient is not leaning forward. She's leaning backwards. So all that blood will, will travel down the back of her throat. Um, she's also, pinching the bony bridge of her nose, which will not do her any good because it doesn't stop anything from happening. So she needs to um, pitch the soft part of her nose as well. So this is just what we talked about. Head forward of a bowl, pinch the lower part of nose, breathe through mouth, spit out blood and ice pack. You do this for all patients that come in with, it, with an epistaxis, even if it's quite severe because it can at least limit the amount of blood and often stops the bleeding from happening. Let's say that the bleeding continues despite proper first aid. Ideally, you want to see these patients in ED 
because you want as many people around you as possible if you need extra help or if you need to resuscitate the patient. You don't want to be alone in a ward in some random corner of the hospital with just you and the patient. So let's say you are called down to ED and you have to go. Um, what do you take with you? So apron, mask, gloves, so PPE. Don't forget a headlight and visor. The visor, I, I definitely do advise because you will get a lot of blood that's been sprayed onto your face and you need proper protection from that and a headlight to look up the nostril. Um, what I would do then is, you know, ATLS approach, it resuscitate the patient using A, B, C, D, E. Um, and in C, don't forget to do a blood test to look for any clotting abnormalities. The HB, if they've been bleeding a lot, fit them with a cannula if they don't already have it basic set of observations and just correct any abnormalities. And then ENT examination wise, I'd use a thudicum and headlights to have a look up the nose to see if I can see any area where the bleeding is coming from. And then I would also check in the back of their mouths to see if I can see blood trickling down the back and how severe it is. <clears throat> this is what a thudicum looks like in case you're wondering. It's this metal instrument that you use to part the nostrils so you can have a better look up a patient's nose. So history and examination wise, after you've taken a basic history and examined, any, his, um, any ENT specific history I would ask about concerning the nosebleed would be when did it start? Why did it happen? So any history of trauma? Well, did they bang their nose against something? Did someone punch them? Were they picking their nose? Um, any first aid measures so what have they already tried any previous ENT medical history have they had regular nosebleeds is something that they're concerned about any medications they're on specifically any anticoagulants or antiplatelets do they have hypertension and um, ask you know what nostril is the bleeding coming from as well because that might become important in treatment uh, anticoagulation wise Usually there's no benefit to stopping anticoagulation if the bleeding stops with an anterior pack or any intervention. If they are having heavy like torrential bleeding, their INRs greater than 10, or if they don't respond to any packing you do at the front, then you have to consider reversal. So like warfarin reversal, etc. You can also give them a little bit of tranexamic acid, which can help stop the bleeding too. Treatment options. So let's say that your first aid measures did not work. What I would do is then direct visualize, try and visualize the bleeding where it's coming from. So in this picture here, as you can see, this is the littles area and the blood vessels are red, angry and bleeding. So what I want to do is take a cautery stick, which looks like a match stick with a little silver nitrate at the top and just um, touch the area where the bleeding is coming from for, uh, for a few seconds, and that should burn the area. And that should stop the bleeding. Remember before you do this, to numb the area, and we'll talk about that in our next slide. So let's say you've you know, cauterized the area. You can also insert some um, nasal pore sponge, um, which just helps to keep the area packed. The patient can go home with it and it will dissolve by itself within a few days time. Um, I wouldn't cauterize repeatedly. So again and again and again, or both sides of the nasal septum or large areas, because then that can cause <laughs> necrosis of the tissue and you get a perforation and, or a hole in between the septum. I also wouldn't cauterize if they have low platelets um, because they will continue to bleed and the cautery won't help. Uh, this is the xylocaine spray that I was talking about earlier. Um, what I would do is uh, apply two to three um, sprays up the patient's nose, allow 30 to 40 seconds for it to, to, it to become numb and then proceed with cautery or any packing because you don't want it to be painful for the patient. If the nasal pore and cautery are unsuccessful, then it's time to pack the nose. Remember, packing is not the first line treatment. You should probably try all the stuff we talked about beforehand because um, it does cause mucosal trauma. It can be painful or uncomfortable for the patient. And you know, it, with a lot of hospitals, if you do pack the nose, the patient needs to come in 
and stay overnight. So nasal packing wise, um, what we use in our hospital is rapid rhino, which looks sort of like a tampon there. It's a, a balloon covered in this gauze like thing, and it has um, one or two tails that you can use to inflate it with. So what we do is we usually insert in horizontally, not vertically, horizontally uh, through the nose and then um, fill it with air. So you've got five mils of air. You could fill it up more and more if the bleeding is not stopping. And um, as you can see, there's two different types that are displayed here, one with two um, lumens and one with one. The one lumen one is for anterior nosebleeds because it's a bit smaller. It doesn't go all the way to the back. Um, that's the one I would use first, unless you were quite suspicious of a posterior bleed. What you want to avoid doing is um, not putting it in all the way. So with the pictures, as you can see, all of that is in the nostril. None of it is dangling out. If it's dangling out, it won't stop any nosebleeds. The posterior pack is the thing that we just talked about um, with the double lumens, the, so the two holes. And it's just a bit longer. It goes all the way to the back to stop any bleeding in the back. You could try that if the bleeding is not controlled with an anterior pack, or if you think that you're quite suspicious that they have a posterior bleed because you, you can see lots of blood going down the back of their throat. Um, the other thing you can use is a Foley catheter, which is just your standard urinary catheter. What you do is it's a two person technique. You um, insert the catheter up the nostril, down, inflate it with about 10 mils of air and pull it forwards. And then you secure that with an umbilical clamp. And then you pack the front of the nose as well to hold it in place too, with either BIP or nasopore or even a, an anterior rapid rhino. If they continue to bleed, remember you can always insert two to three more mils of air because it might just be that the tamponade is, effect is not enough. And I would give that 10 minutes to see if they continue to bleed. That usually helps to resolve the issue. If that doesn't, then remember you could always call your registrar for help uh, uh, to see what further steps you could take. It might be that they need to go to theater to have their arteries ligated. Um, post bleeding advice, let's say none of that happens and, and you know bleeding settles with basic first aid advice. Um, I prescribe my patients naseptin cream um, which has some peanut oil in it. So I think you can't give it if they're allergic to peanuts. And I just tell patients to put it in both nostrils, just a little pea size amount every day or twice a day uh, for a few days, um, just to prevent any further bleeds from happening. And then just advice, uh, don't pick or blow their nose, uh, avoid straining, heavy lifting, no super hot food or drink because we don't want the nose bleeding to start again. If it does, then I would teach them the proper first aid technique that we just talked about. And if it's still continuing to bleed after 15, 20 minutes to seek help. Um, which concludes today's session. I hope that you guys learned something um, and I'm looking forward to teaching you again.